Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Hey, real quick, um, every time I'm in the service, I get to worship. I'm just really so grateful for our worship team led by Drew Greenway. Can we give a round of applause for our worship team? <laughs> Truly, hey, I, I know most weeks it's, it's Drew up here, it's JP up here, and they're, they're gifted. They have, a, they have a lot of gifts that God has given them. They also love Jesus. So be encouraged. You are led each and every week by people that love Jesus first and foremost. My name is Derek Davidson. I have the privilege of serving families in this church with the kids and youth ministry. If we've never met before, my wife Kelly and I, we've been married for six years. We have four kids, ages 10, 8, 7, and 3. It's a, it's a handful. And some of you are really quick with math. You're like married for six years, 10, 8, and 7. My wife and I, we've only been parents for actually for four years because all of our kids are adopted through foster care. So it's been a journey that we've just been on these last four years. And some of you are parenting veterans, and so you already knew this. I am learning this. Traveling with kids is stressful. Can I get an amen, parents? Yeah, recently I traveled by myself, and it kind of felt like a spa day. You know, my flight was delayed, and just meant I was by myself a little bit longer. It's like, no worries at all. Security line was long. It's like, whatever. I mean, this is easy. Because when you're traveling, when you're flying, you're navigating, you know, parking, security lines, tickets, luggage, rental cars. And then you add the kids on top of that. They have their needs, their emotions. They get hungry. They get thirsty. Routines are off. You're always missing nap time when you travel. It never works out. So I promise my wife and I, we're, we're decent parents. But a lot of our rules, we just throw out the window when we travel. We're pretty strict with screen time. Our kids have these like kid tablets that they don't, they don't get to use very much, except for when we travel. Then we charge those things up and they can use it as much as they want. We're pretty strict with food. We don't do a lot of fast food, except for every time we travel, they get a happy meal and they're sometimes happy. <laughs> and like sugar, we're, we try to be careful with sugar. Sugar affects kids, but man, on the plane, get the juices, get the airplane cookies, because we're just going to do whatever we can to help that journey be a little bit better. My parents kind of did that with me a little bit uh, unintentionally. I grew up in the 90s, a 90s Christian kid, which meant I didn't have cable. So anytime we went to hotels, I got to watch Sports Center. It was like the best thing in the world, like Disney World. And still to this day, when I go stay in a hotel, I don't even watch Sports Center anymore. I, I stay in a hotel, I love it. It's like the Pavlov's dog thing. It's like every time I go to a hotel, it feels like the best thing in the world because when I traveled, I got to do that. And I don't know what you do when you travel. I don't know what you do with your kids. I, I'm sure there are things that you do to help the journey. There may be certain snacks that you always get on your road trips, a certain drink you always get on your road trips. Maybe you're the sunflower seed guy. You get that cup right there. Maybe there's a podcast that you always listen to when you go on long road trips, a certain artist that you listen to when you go on road trips. There's things that we all do to help us on our journeys, to help us have hope for the journey ahead. And I, I tell you those stories, not just to introduce you to my family, but because we're, we're in the series called soundtracks where we're looking at the book of Psalms. And this morning we're in a Psalm, Psalm 121, which was literally a soundtrack for the Israelites as they travel. Psalm 121 is in this group of Psalms called the Song of Ascent, the Songs of Ascent. And it's these group of Psalms that the Israelites would sing. It's a, a group of songs, songs and Psalms. It's, it's hard. It's a group of songs that the Israelites would sing as they journeyed to Jerusalem. See, we have, we have a picture of Jerusalem that we're going to put up here. This is, this is modern day Jerusalem. And as you, as you can tell, it's, it's on a higher elevation. So anytime the Israelites were traveling to Jerusalem for religious rituals, for festivals, to worship, to sacrifice to God, they would always be ascending. They'd all, always be traveling uphill. And they would sing these songs to remind themselves of the hope that they had in God, the God that they were going to worship. Why would they need hope on a journey? Like I said, traveling with kids is stressful, but how is, you know, I'm talking about airplanes and cars and tablets. Like it's not that bad in 2023, even though I may complain about it. If you're an ancient Israelite traveling to Jerusalem, you're not taking an airplane, you're walking. You're walking a long distance over days 
you're on a path that it's only called a path because other people have gone the same direction. It's not paved. That's a hard journey. You're outside, you're dealing with sun and cold and wind. It's exhausting, it's tiring, it can be dangerous. There's wild animals, there's potentially criminals along the path. So they would sing these songs as a reminder of the hope that they had in God as they journeyed. And that's what we're gonna be talking about this morning, having hope for the journey. Now, why do we need to hear that this morning? I don't think any of us are going on a pilgrimage anytime soon, though some of you may still have the road trips left with your kids. If so, God bless you. I'll be praying for you. But I think we need to hear the psalm this morning because like the great theologians, Rascal Flatts taught us, and I know Rascal Flatts didn't write it, life is a highway, right? Our lives are a journey. We're on this journey called life and there's great moments There's beautiful moments, there's fun moments, but then there's hard moments. There's moments you never saw coming. There's miscarriage and loss and grief, financial struggles, prodigal children. How do we continue to have hope for this journey we're on when so many hard things come along the way? And what does the scriptures have to say about that? The Psalms are a depth of riches for life's biggest questions. There's so many genres in scripture, but Psalms is a book of songs, of prayers, of pleas from people towards God. Martin Luther actually preached through the book of Psalms in his his first book that he ever preached through. And he said that the book of Psalms was the Bible in miniature. Everything we see in scripture, we can see in this one book. The Benedictine monks would pray five psalms a day as they worked in order to to connect with God. In the psalms, we see the depths of humanity, the depths of our faith as we connect with God. And this morning, we're we're gonna let Psalm 121 show us how we can have hope for this journey of life. So let's look at our text starting in verse one. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And this this psalm is so beautiful, so poetic. You may have heard these lines in a song before. And the, the first point that we get from this psalm just in these first two verses is really simple. Our God helps. Our God helps. And in this first verse, the the author of the psalm is looking towards the mountains, and it can mean one of two things. One, he's looking at the mountains, and he's remembering the creator of those mountains. So he's looking at the mountains, and the mountains are helping him to worship God. Or it can mean something a little different, something this, this is what I think it means, and others think this as well, is that he's looking at the mountains, and he's looking at the mountains in contrast to the God of the mountains. And why he may have been doing that is because along the mountains in this area, is where a lot of pagan religious rituals would happen. When you're reading the Old Testament, you'll hear about high places, oftentimes throughout Israel, throughout that Canaanite area. And this is what it was referring to. In the hills, there would be shrines like this where people would sacrifice to the false gods of that time. And along a well-traveled path, there would be places, shrines that you could stop off and you could sacrifice to the false gods in order to have safety along your journey. And then the, so the author of this psalms and the people singing this psalm are looking at those hills, knowing that's where religious rituals are happening and, and reminding themselves that that's not where their help comes from. Their help doesn't come from those gods. Their help comes from the true God, their God, the, the creator of the mountains, the creator of the hills. It's almost like we could rewrite the psalm like this. I lift my eyes to the hills. Does my help come from there? No, my help comes from the Lord. And I really think that makes it so applicable for us today because so often we look to the created things rather than the creator. We look to other things for our help rather than God. First, a quick story. This right here is David Blair's key. Does anyone know who David Blair is? That's okay. I didn't know who David Blair was until this week either. Has anyone heard of the Titanic? 
right? Big Leo fans. In the... Well, David Blair was actually the second officer on the Titanic. He was assigned to the Titanic until about a week before it left for its maiden voyage, the fateful voyage we've all heard of. When he left the Titanic to go to the job he was reassigned to, he took this key with him. This was the key to his locker, which shouldn't be a big deal, except for the only pair of binoculars on the ship was in his locker. So when they left for the voyage, the crew that was assigned to be lookout, to be looking out for danger ahead of them, like an iceberg, they had to use their eyes because they couldn't access the one thing that could help them, binoculars. This is a true story. The, the key is, is on display in a museum in China. It's been sold in multiple auctions throughout the years. And it, it's tragic to think that the thing that could have helped them was just out of their reach. What's even more tragic is the God that can help us, we always have access to, yet we so often turn to things that are inadequate. I so often turn to things that are inadequate as I am walking through struggles in life, as we are walking through struggles in life, sometimes we don't even pray about it first. We're, we turn to the things of this world, other people, ourselves, family struggles, financial struggles. And we rather check out with our phone or have a glass of wine that turns into two or three. We'd rather call our parent that we think has the best advice or our college friend that we think has the best advice before we even pray about it to our God. We so often turn to other things before we turn to God for our help. Christians have pointed to three lies that we, that we can be, tend to believe about ourselves, about our ultimate identity, and about where we find our ultimate help. The three lies are this. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what others think of me. And I think we, we each are prone to believe one of these lies more than the others. The first one, I am what I do. I am what I have, my money, my bank account, my possessions, my car, my house, the things of this world, that's what defines me. That's where I go to for my help. The second one, I am what I do. My resume, my job, my promotions, my GPA, my athletic ability, myself. I define who I am. I'm who I turn to when I need help. And the last one, and this is the one I'm most tempted to believe. I am what others think of me, my reputation, my friendships, people's perspectives of me. Others define who I am. Others are who I turn to when I need help. And the truth is only God defines us. Only God is who can give us our ultimate help. See, we may not have been tempted to stop off of Highway 84 to worship the false gods, but there are false gods in our life that we are tempted to turn to for our help. Too often we worship the created things rather than the creator, rather than the one who can bring us help. What this psalm teaches us is that God is our help. But we have a God who does more than help from afar. Starting back in verse three. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. See, we don't just have a God who helps from afar. We have a God who sees us, which is our second point. Our God sees. Our God is near. He's personal. He never sleeps. He never takes his eyes off of us. And again, it seems like the, the author of this psalm is comparing God to the false gods of that day. Because there was a lot of stories about the false gods of that day who would party, they would use their powers, use the things that they had, and they would party, they would oversleep, and then the people would have to wake them up in order to get help from them. Which sounds kind of weird, but we actually have an example of that in Scripture. In 1 Kings 18, the prophet of God, Elijah, is in this battle, in quotes, with the prophets of Baal. 
And of course, nothing is happening when the prophets of Baal are trying to do something because Baal's not real. And so Elijah starts to mock them. In verse 27, he says this. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. And what the psalmist and the Israelites are reminding themselves is their God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He always has their eyes on, on them. Their God is personal. The personal name for God, Yahweh, is used three times in this chapter. Six times, the, the Hebrew word shamar, which means to keep or guard, but in a nearness sense, is used. The depiction of God in this chapter is a personal God. Tara Lee Cobble, who's a Bible expert, and she uh, writes the Bible recap. She says that, that God in this psalm is like a bodyguard. He's not far off in a watchtower. He watches, but he's near. When our kids first came to our home, sleep was something that was really hard for them. They really struggled with sleep. And one of our kids in particular would only sleep if my wife Kelly was in the room. And I know it's not just adopted kids. I'm sure some of you parents have gone through those seasons where your kids want you right next to them when you're sleeping. So my wife would do what any good parent would do. She would wait till our kid fell asleep and then she would leave the room. But of course at 2 a.m., our kid would come back to our room and Kelly would go back to the room and help our child fall asleep. But we didn't want that to continue. So we kept pushing our kid to, to sleep. So eventually our child was okay with Kelly just sitting outside the room. As long as Kelly was sitting with her back to the door, our child would fall asleep. And then eventually our child was okay with just the lamp being on in the room. As long as the lamp was on in the room, our child would feel safe and fall asleep. And now all of our kids, man, they, they, they pass out. You know, the kids sleep when their feet are on the pillow, their arms are off the bed. They pass out like rocks because they feel safe. They know that they're watched. They know that they're near and they sleep soundly. The application for us this morning is, do we believe that our God sees us? And not just theologically, as I was in this text this week, I was thinking, I, I know I believe that theologically. Like, God, I know you see everyone, but do I believe that he sees me? Do you believe that God sees you personally, that he is near to you? And if you don't, that's okay. You may be wondering, hey, how do I believe that? How do I believe that God sees me? And I want to encourage you, you're, you're doing it. You're showing up. You're surrounding yourself with other people that believe that and can point you towards the God that sees. Continue to go to God in your unbelief. Ask him to help you in your unbelief. Because what this psalm teaches us is that our God sees us. And he does more than sees. Jumping back into the text, the end of verse 5. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Our third and our last point this morning is our God protects. Our God protects. And in verse six, we see that God is protecting them from two things. The first one is the sun. And that's pretty easy for us to understand here in Waco, Texas in the summer. I was playing pickleball outside this week and it took me like two days to recover after. That sun is strong. If, if you're on a long journey walking over days, man, shade brings relief. It would bring comfort and peace. And they are reminding themselves that the Lord is their shade. The second thing that the psalm is saying that God protects them from is the moon. And that's a little bit interesting. What does that mean? How could God protect them from the moon? Well, um, ancient civilizations thought that moon rays would affect your emotions and your mind. It's kind of interesting. Over a long journey, there'd be a lot of physical toil, but there'd also be an emotional toil that would go alongside of that. And they thought it was the moon rays that affected them. I don't think that's the case and that's okay. Because what I think we can take away from that is, is there's a figurative sense to the sun and the moon. The sun is obvious. The moon is subtle. God protects them from the obvious things 
and the subtle things. God protects us from the obvious dangers and the subtle dangers. God protects us from both. And right when I say that, there's a, there's a conflict inside of me, and I'm sure a lot of you, because maybe it's felt like God hasn't protected you in your life. Either yourself or a loved one, or at least from afar, you've, it seems like God hasn't protected them. What do we do with that? This, is, this isn't a new question. People of God have wrestled with this question for a long time. I believe the Israelites, as they sang this song, did believe that God would protect, would, would protect them on their journey, would protect them from the dangers on their travels. And even if he didn't, they believed he would protect them in eternity, both now and forevermore. They give me the mic to preach up here about once a year. So last summer, I told you that we were giving our youngest daughter swim lessons. And I'm happy to report she's crushing it. She doesn't need her floaties anymore. She's a big girl. And she's swimming. She's jumping off the side. She's doing cannonballs. She's swimming around in the shallow water. She loves the water. She has so much fun in the water. So what she loves to do is she loves to swim to me. She'll go to the, from the steps. I'll go out about five, six feet, and she'll push off, and she'll start swimming to me. But because I'm a good dad, I, sometimes it takes a few steps back, and it makes that five-foot distance about a seven-foot or a ten-foot distance. And my daughter makes it, but she struggles. There's a little bit of pain involved. She's not super happy with me. She takes in a little bit of water. But I'm doing that because I ultimately want her to be safe in the water, not just have fun in the water. I think we need to really understand and believe that God's ultimate goal isn't for us to be safe in this world. God's ultimate goal is to reconcile the world and us to himself through Jesus Christ. God's ultimate goal isn't our safety in this world, but our safety in eternity. And sometimes being safe in this world lines up with being safe in eternity, and sometimes it doesn't. This is a theme throughout Scripture. Paul picks up this same idea in Romans 8 when he says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, and he's quoting Psalm 44 right here. For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've been in church before, you've probably heard those last two, last two verses a lot, but oftentimes they're removed from the first couple of verses because Paul experienced all those things. Paul experienced hunger. Paul experienced hardship. He was persecuted and he ultimately experienced a sword, yet he believed he would never, never be separated from Christ Jesus as Lord. <coughs> he knew he was protected in eternity. Now I know there are stories in this room that that temporary pain feels anything but temporary. I'm so sorry. And God is so sorry. Myself, our, our journey the last four years has been nothing I ever thought it was gonna be. It was, it's been much more hard, much more difficult than anything I've ever anticipated. And I know the hardship that we've experienced doesn't even pale in comparison to some of the hardship in this room. For, for some of us, the pain that we experience in this world will never make sense on this side of eternity. My prayer for you is just keep going. Keep going on this journey and be encouraged that you join a long tradition of believers that have experienced hardship and difficulties on this journey, but have still found God to be faithful in the end. 
and some of us, and I can be in this category as well, we are living our lives for, for protection in this world. We are living our journeys on a, in a way to be safe in this world, and we are going to miss the journey that God has for us. We are pursuing safety in this world rather than safety in eternity. And God wants to tell you, you're going to miss out. It's not the journey he has for you. Because God will protect us. And ultimately, he will protect us forever. In summary, we have hope for this journey because our God helps, our God sees, and our God protects. Before we wrap up, we're going to spend three minutes on our own writing out our own psalm, our own prayer. The psalms can teach us more than just the theologically. They can teach us how to pray, how to connect with God. That's how the church has read the psalms throughout the last 2,000 years. So we're going to spend this morning writing a prayer for ourselves that we can pray every single morning before we go on the journey for that day. And we're going to use Psalm 121 as our structure to help. I wrote out <coughs> a prayer and we're going to put it on the screen using the themes that we looked at. Lord, I can turn my eyes to my mind, my money, my reputation. Does my help come from there? Nope. You are my help. I thank you that you see me at all times. When my family is struggling, you are present. When I struggle with self-doubt, you are there. Thank you for protecting me from evil and help me to live today with my eternal protection at the front of my mind. So whether you're watching at home or you're here, you can take out your phone, take out a journal and just spend a few minutes using this Psalm to write out a prayer to God. You can do that prayerfully. My prayer is that we would pray that each morning this week to help us live the journey as God intended.
Some of you are still writing. It's, that's okay. You can, you can keep going. I'm just going to close with this story. Every morning I read a, a devotional from this organization called The Voice of the Martyrs. And it shares the story of a believer throughout Christian history, current believers, believers in the past that have suffered for their faith. And there's one I want to share with us this morning. When Voice of Martyr workers met Sister Tong in China, she had recently been released from prison after serving six months for hosting an unregistered house church meeting in her home. When they asked her to tell them about the prison, they expected to hear about hardship, discomfort, and suffering. Oh yes, Sister Tong replied with a glowing smile. That was a wonderful time. The workers quickly looked at the translator thinking there must have been some confusion in translating their question. After all, they had asked her about a Chinese prison, not some vacation spot. But there was no translation error. Sister Tong had understood the question and she'd answered it honestly. She thought prison was a wonderful time because God had ministered to her heart while she was inside, offering her comfort and peace, even in the midst of suffering. In addition, she had opportunities to share the gospel with other women in her cell, and several of them had accepted Christ. Sure, it was hard to be away from her family, but for this Chinese Christian, the presence of Christ and the opportunity to minister in his name made even prison a wonderful time. And I read a story like this every single morning and it, and it challenges me because it puts my life in perspective and it challenges my faith. That's a different faith than I have every single day. But it's the same faith that we can have. It's the same perspective that we can have because they worship the same Jesus that, that we do. They have found the same Jesus to be faithful. That no matter what happens in this world, they have found him to be faithful in eternity. And that's the faith that we can live out. And my prayer for myself, my prayer for us, is that we will live the journey each and every day with that in mind. Let me pray that we would. God, thank you for your scriptures that point us towards you. God, thank you for the, the witness of the church that points us towards you. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the ways that you displayed your faithfulness throughout time and history, but especially 2,000 years ago on a cross where you looked at the journey that you had, the suffering that you had to endure. But you said it was worth it. God, I know any faithfulness that I have pales in comparison to the faithfulness that you've already shown me. Thank you for the grace when I am not faithful. But God, empower us to live this journey with you in the forefront of our mind. God, we love you so much. Amen.